Hello, and welcome to another Center for Progressive Urban Politics podcast. Today is Friday, November 22nd, and I have the distinct pleasure to be with an old friend, Dmitry Orlov. Dmitry, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. Well, Dmitry, uh, for those who may not be well initiated with your work, uh, you have done some amazing research when it comes to looking at collapse and also com comparing and contrasting America and Russia. You came to the United States as an immigrant when you were a child in the 70s. Uh, you now recently moved back to Russia. And in that time, you, you've written a number of books, one of which was called Reinventing Collapse, which I think is probably the, the work you're best known for, where when you were living in the United States, you went back to the Soviet Union as the collapse was taking place. And you chronicled it and you looked at what was happening and how, what lessons Americans could probably take from that in terms of how prepared we are. Because there were certainly aspects where as, as backward as the Russian economy might have appeared and other facets of Soviet life, they were actually could end up being much better prepared for collapse than we are and what I think ultimately will happen to America and our economic system. Uh, you've written a number of books on the technosphere and artificial intelligence. Uh, you're a publisher of other people's books. And currently, you have an amazing blog. Uh, and I really strongly suggest everyone go and subscribe to your Club Orlov blog. I know I do. And it's always uh, gives me some fascinating insights uh, on geopolitics uh, as well as local politics, economics, it's just a great source for me. But Dimitri, I have you here today for something very specific. And that is, a few weeks ago, I attended the 2019 Politicon. Now this was my fourth Politicon. For those who have never been to Politicon, it's kind of like Comic-Con for political geeks, wonks. Uh, and it's like mixing nitro and glycerin together. For instance, you might have Van Jones and Ann Coulter up on the same stage, or Ben Shapiro and Cenk Ungar facing off. Well, one of the panels at this year's Politicon was called Russia, Russia, Russia. And it was a five-person panel, uh, most of whom you'd recognize from cable television, cable news, uh, MSNBC, CNN, uh, RT. And it was basically, with the exception of one panelist, a big hate fest on Russia and Putin. And I, you know, being a reader of Club Orlov and your experiences now that you're back in Russia and my knowledge of history, geopolitics, uh, I, myself, I was a counterintelligence officer in the 1980s. I worked in Europe for NATO, uh, Soviet, we called it Soviet threat was something I had studied intensely. A sister of mine uh, got a, her bachelor's and master's degree in Slavic language and literature. So I feel that I'm pretty acclimated to the, you know, a lot of facets of Russian history, if not, you know, somewhat superficially. And I was really in the, I was having a visceral, visceral response to how this panel was going and how they were uh, basically villainizing Russia and Putin and I just saw the hypocrisy being displayed. And again, the, the retelling of this failed narrative of the Russians having elected Trump by involving themselves in the 2016 elections. So I thought, Dimitri, I'd pay, play one, I'm gonna play, it'll end up being like 15 clips. And then I'd like to have a discussion with you at the end of each clip on what you thought of it. Uh, but I'd like to start off with the intro to the panel from Malcolm Nance, and people will probably recognize him from MSNBC. One moment. I'll go ahead and show my screen here in a moment. But folks might recognize him from MSNBC. 
uh, like he'll describe here, he's a former intelligence officer. And uh, this, I think, sets the tone. Now, Dimitri, can you see the screen? Yes. Right. I'll go ahead, enlarge that, and play that for our audience. Because uh, that's all we hear about all day and all night. But I'm going to focus on the Trump-Russia scandal. <laughs> uh, principally, it's, it's not just because I wrote three books on the matter. Uh, it's because, as an intelligence, former intelligence professional, I recognize the threat that Russia presents to the world today. Okay, the threat that Russia presents to the world today. So I'm gonna jump into, that set the tone. What I'd like to do, uh, Dimitri, is jump into our next clip. And put my cursor back over here. And I think our audience is gonna appreciate actually hearing and seeing this. Okay, so this is the first clip where they talk about the economy of Russia. Let's get a couple of things straight. I, mean, I just want to stipulate some things. And I've said this on television many times. Russia is a trailer park with atomic bombs. Okay? They do not have a very large economy. We have more trade with Chile than we do with Russia. Russia produces weapon systems, oil, and natural gas. And okay, Dimitri. So tell me, is the Russian economy nothing more than a trailer park with atomic weapons? <laughs> well, I that's mean, that's actually, you know, absolutely hilarious because this person clearly doesn't have much of a grasp of facts. Now, um, you can you can look at the size of the economy in in dollars or euros at the current conversion rate, but that's relatively meaningless. What you have to uh, take into account is how far the money goes. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there are lots of examples of that. For instance, um, I can go downstairs right now and have a really good meal, you know, the sort of thing that I like to eat, to eat since I'm Russian. So I, I like to have a three course meal, you know, borscht mm -hmm. for, for soup, then I'll, I'll have blini for, for the main course meal, and then I'll have a compote, which is uh, stewed fruit for, for dessert. If I were to try to find that in Manhattan, it wouldn't cost me $3, it would cost me $70. And it wouldn't right. be as good. So that's, you know, purchasing parity. Uh, there are lots of other similar examples. If I were to uh, need an ep appendectomy while on a visit to the United States, no insurance, that would probably cost me on the order of sixty dollars to $80,000. If that were to happen to me in Moscow, that would cost me two thousand dollars. See the difference? Absolutely. So in the United States, they 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 register the ridiculous cost of doing various things as their GDP, and based on that, they claim that their economy is absolutely huge. Of course, what they're doing is they're gouging each other. The Americans are gouging each other. The Russians are not, and therefore the Russian economy looks small. But if you take the, the, the purchasing parity into account, it turns out that uh, the Ru Russian economy is sixth largest in the world after Germany. But then Germany has been dropping by a uh, single digit, sometimes more mm -hmm. in terms of its industrial production um, and moving factories very aggressively to Russia. So Mercedes built, built a factory in Russia. Lots of, I, I talked to a German, uh, consultant yesterday whose whose job is moving as many factories out of Germany and into Russia as possible. So Germany is going to be sixth largest pretty soon and Russia is going to be fifth largest. And there aren't that many countries that are that big. There's uh, China, followed by the United States, followed by India, followed by Japan, followed by Russia. Now Japan is probably going to is, is probably going to be the next one. Japan is the reason Russia will be fourth largest in the coming years. I don't think Russia will ever surpass India, though, just because of the size of the population. So this right. fellow just doesn't have his numbers right. Right. There are a number of things that he doesn't have right. And uh, at the end, I'll, I'll talk to you about, I actually bumped into Malcolm Nance outside on, this, on a street corner after the panel, and we kind of got into it. But uh, I want to play this next clip, Dimitri. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and pull that up, move that over to screen two. 
and enlarge a little bit for our audience. And I will share our screen once more. Desktop two. Okay. And prior to the rise of Putin, they had become a corrupt kleptocratic society that was toying around with the edges of democracy. Now with Vladimir Putin, it has become an autocracy. Putin actually has adopted the code of the philosophy of Tsar Nicholas I. Oligarchy, autocracy, orthodoxy in religion. But what they didn't add was kleptocracy, which was to steal whatever you could and sell it. And that's how this person... Wow. Uh, so, Dimitri, is Russia a kleptocracy? Not so much anymore. Um, it, it went that way uh, uh, in the late 80s, and then it became basically... Uh, uh, a criminal state in the 90s. And do you and think then, in the, uh, the, if I could, in the late 80s, was that pretty much uh, that people were seeing the demise coming? So it was like, okay, let's fill my pockets, do what I can for me and my family uh, prior to the collapse? Well, no, actually, the, you know, uh, the Russians and, and various other peoples of the Soviet Union were probably uh, the last diehard communists that there were, um, there they, they were traitors within the Communist Party itself. At some point in the late 80s, it basically negated uh, the communist ideology. Hmm. It, it basically made it unnecessary and basically used the structure of the Communist Party in order to rob the country blind uh, in, in as many ways as possible. They basically tried to feather their own nests. Kind of like, kind of, of kind of like our upper one tenth of our upper one percent here in America in terms of wealth. They they seem to be extracting an awful lot of wealth from the system. Well, yes, and then that the whole that whole thing went basically on steroids after the Soviet Union fell apart, and and Western consultants like Jeffrey Sachs went mm -hmm. in there and and. Uh, there, there was a privatization program where uh, a whole bunch of oligarchs uh, basically privatized, quote unquote, but actually stole government resources that had to be privatized in a hurry. And, and that was just wholesale robbery. Hmm. And, and they, uh, they expatriated a lot of that wealth. A lot of them bought mansions in London and set themselves up. And then after a period of time, they, they sort of killed each other. Uh, so it's not a there's no happy end for the for the for the Russian kleptocrats and then Putin came to power and, and basically invalidated the whole deal. So now, you know, there are wealthy people in Russia, but they don't have much political influence. Interesting. So uh, I, I characterize the US the, the current political system in the US as just about a kleptocracy. Uh, you look at what's happened in terms of the financialization of our system. We don't make anything here anymore. Uh, it's all of our manufacturers, much of it has been pushed offshore. What they couldn't push offshore, they uh, are offshoring, uh, they're coming in, stripping the IP out between people's ears of our knowledge workers and moving those jobs overseas as well. And who's benefiting from that? Well. The, the, the owners of the stock of these companies that are doing it, the people that are chasing these enormous profits through the free flow of capital and people across international borders with no regard for the nation state. I, at least that's my take on what's happening here in America. So I find it a bit hypocritical when they're looking at Russia as a kleptocracy and not talking about uh, the United States. Well, the difference uh, is that, you know, Americans look at corruption in other parts of the world and they say, oh, you're doing illegal things. That's bad. You're corrupt. Uh, the difference is that in the United States, corruption is legalized. It's perfectly legal. It's called well, lobbying. Yeah, and, and, and it's called the justice system where you pay to get the outcome you need. You just hire the best lawyers. And if the other side can't afford the best lawyers, then you win. Yeah, and if you go up against the, the federal government, 
98% of the time, you will lose. Uh, <laughs> they'll throw the resources of the state against you. So, yeah, well, wonderful. We got a lot of clips to play. The next one I'm going to play is a, a theme that kept coming up during the panel discussion. And that seems to be that uh, President Trump and Pre President Putin are star-crossed lovers somehow. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and share <laughs> this screen. Okay. And I will enlarge that for our audience. Okay. This person, an ex-KGB middling colonel, became one of the richest men in the world. And one of the people who is most fascinated with him and absolutely abjectly in love with him <laughs> is Donald Trump. Now, <laughs> well, there you have it. <clears throat> Donald Trump is in love with Vladimir Putin. Well, I, I, I think uh, that his love is unrequited uh, <laughs> because Putin, Putin is married to Russia. He's spoken for, uh, yeah. no, not looking for any outside relationship at this point. Uh, in terms of Putin's fabulous wealth, there's never been any evidence of that. And in fact, it's very hard to see why why Putin would, would bother with that. Uh, he's got a, a very serious job to do that um, he can do at public expense. Mm -hmm. He's got a jet he can fly around on. He's got his, his dodges that are paid for. Uh, the one in Sachi is quite fabulous. Uh, it, it's an official residence. It's, it's owned by the state. So basically everything he does is owned by the state. Uh, in terms of his personal habits, he, he's Spartan. Um, you know, that, that, that's a typical thing for Russian leaders, you know? Stalin, not, probably not anyone's favorite person, but when he died, he left, down, he left behind uh, several hundred rubles in a savings account and an army trench coat. Those were, that, that was the sum total of his personal possessions. I don't think Putin is going to be all that different. He, Putin is no oligarch. He's very good at, at playing oligarchs against, against each other, but he has no personal aspirations, as far as I can tell, of, of being one. So, and you said something earlier that I'd like to, to exp you to expound a bit more on. You had talked of, of Putin as a nationalist. He, his love, his, he's already uh, spoken for, and that person is Russia. Uh, you reminded me, I was reading a book on ancient Greece years ago, and it was, and at that time, right, just before that period that entered into the golden age, the, the writer said, it was said of the, the, the Athenian that every Athenian has a mistress and that mistress is Athens. And I think that's where that store of virtue came from that launched them into their golden age and unfortunately into their time of empire and their fall. But he, that's to me, I, I think it would be great to have a a leader that puts their country first before all other special interests, before the interests of other countries. I mean, why is that such a bad thing? Well, that's well, the difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is where you love your country. You may love others as well, but you love your country the best. Nationalism is where you kind of like your country, but you hate all the others. So Putin is mm -hmm. definitely a patriot. He's neutral about every other country in the world, uh, but he's passionate about Russia. Right, and you know, we should be so lucky to have uh, leaders here in the US that put their country's needs before everyone else. But it seems that everyone has bought off on this neoliberal view that we should have the free movement of people and money across borders so as to maximize profits, because it's all about the maximization of the profit. And it's not really about what's good for the nation state and the citizens of that nation state. Now, as far as uh, Trump being in love with Putin, there may be a grain of truth to that. Um, and the way it works is on a psychological level, not on a political level. Trump is definitely a, a narcissist. You can see that in, Absolutely. in, in the way he projects himself. He's very focused on himself. He's incredibly ego-driven. 
he prides himself on being a successful businessman for what that's worth. You know, uh, I, I don't I, think I, I would want to I, own any of them, but I, I that's okay. That's, that's just a matter of taste. I think um, Gerald Salenti said it best. He was born on third base and thought he had a home run. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's that's one way to put it. But but you see, he's not a statesman. It takes a really long time to become a statesman. Uh, it takes a lot of special training and experience and talent. And and Trump doesn't have any of that. So he he's kind of a bull in a china shop as far as international politics goes. And so he looks at Putin and thinks, well, if if I sort of cozy up to Putin, maybe some of that statesmanship will rub off on me. And I, I think that's the way it works on the subcontinent. Yeah, he, he just, he wants to, to become Putin by osmosis or something like that. Um, it's sort of like a, you know, it's, it's not going to work. It's sort of, you know, if a pig scratches its, its back against the corner of a synagogue, it's not going to become kosher. You know, <laughs> it's just, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, it is tragic for us. Uh, we're, we're seeing, once again, our electoral process play out again. I. Uh, watched the Democratic debates the other night, and it was just nauseating uh, what's coming out. And the only person that seems to grasp the concept of statesmanship and can be a, a possibly be that statesman is Tulsi Gabbard, and her chances of getting elected are probably nil. Yes, I would agree with that. All right. On All right, the next, next clip. number six, here we go. And this is about the meddling in the elections. And I'm gonna go ahead and share our screen once again. Thirty percent, or maybe more, let's call it thirty-nine percent of this nation refuses to believe that the United States was attacked in the 2016 election by Russia. And I'm very interested in hearing some of the other my co-panelists, one of whom works for a Russian propaganda organization, the Pravda of the Russia Now, called Russia Today. I'm interested in hearing their version of how they think that small nation with a horrible economy is somehow punching above its weight and Americans in this very convention center refuse to believe anything bad about Vladimir Putin in Russia, who is, by the way, a James Bond evil villain with James Bond evil villain money. Wow, there is a lot to unpack there. I guess I'm one of those people in the audience that just didn't buy off on 2000s, the Russian meddling in 2016. Am, am I wrong, Dimitri? Am I, am I delusional? Well, you know, this is something that a lot of the Russians think is really funny. This is the stuff of like night, Russian night comedy shows. <laughs> it's all about our man Donny in the White House and how he wants to come home. He, he's always begging Putin to bring him home, bring him in. <laughs> uh, and, and Putin tell, tells him, we, we, have to li we have to line up Tulsi Gabbard. Once we do that, you're free to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but none of that is, ta it's, it's impossible to, to take the stuff seriously. Like, if, first of all, um, these things are sort of fact driven, you know, you're just, you, you can't keep saying the same thing and not show any evidence at all. Um, that's called a barefaced lie, and and people who tell barefaced faced lies are barefaced liars. And 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 so there is a point at which you you have to stop taking people like that seriously. It's sort of like you know this is no way to run a kindergarten class. You know somebody somebody needs a timeout at some point. You know that that that's the whole Russian meddling thing. Um, the, the, the hilarious aspect of it is it's somebody messes up and then the crime is that not that they messed up, but that it was discovered and the Russians right. are to blame. And that's a, re that's a repeating theme, you know, and that actually gets funnier every time they use it. It's like, I mess up, they find out the Russians did it. That's and, the logic. And, and the mess up is, I believe the 2016, the general election was supposed between 
supposed to be between Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. I think mm -hmm. Trump uh, went through 12 candidates in the primary like a hot knife through butter, only because he was, he was saying things no one else would ever dream of saying in a primary. And then mm -hmm. he got Clinton on stage and mauled her. And the, the, what I find the, the most hypocritical of all this, Dimitri, uh, and I know we, we should be pressing on because we got a lot of clips to go through, but here we had the Democratic primary of 2016. That election was clearly stolen from Bernie Sanders. Uh, Massachusetts, Arizona, every time they uh, did a recount of the counties in California, Bernie won. Uh, this was reported to the campaign, but the campaign just let it all bounce off. And there Bernie sat at the convention watching Hillary give her acceptance speech. And to me, that's where the meddling was going on. Uh, that's where the uh, election pilfering was going on. And yet here we are locked still into this Russia, Russia, Russia narrative. Yes, well, from the pro from the Russian point of view, it's sort of like uh, uh, a, a whole shelf of of, of uh, porcelain falls over, and and one plate uh, one plate doesn't get broken, and and the Russians get blamed <laughs> for for choosing that plate. That's what it well, looks like. Absolutely, I, my motion sensor on my lights uh, gave out. Yeah, I noticed <laughs> special effects. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Ooh, dark hunting, uh, cavernous looking studio here <laughs> in my office. Okay, so uh, this next clip deals with uh, Russia and the Crimea. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share that screen with you and our audience and share. And here we go. At that time, had been supporting Iran with weapons and machinery. So, you know, cut off, cut off Iran's flows there. There was a very distinct effort at the UN to try and get Russia to bring Assad in Syria to heal, to stop bombing his own people. And what does Russia do? It decides in 2015 it's going to roll in and take a part of Crimea. Not only does it roll in and do that, it decides that it's going to give a place uh, to the then president, who it had paid for and supported, and say, look, this guy, the leader of this country, who has now abandoned his people, is asking us to come in and help. This is part of the grooming that Russia and Putin use. OK, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. So Dimitri, what is your take on Russia, the Crimea, from a vantage point of current events as well as historical uh, perspectives? Well, uh, she started from, from Syria. So I'll start from Syria as well. So basically, um, after Hillary Clinton was instrumental in, in, in toppling uh, Libya, the Libyan government, and that place got infested right. by terrorists, some we of came, those terrorists. <laughs> we came, we saw, he died. Yeah. And it became a slave trading center. Um, a lot of the weapons from there got sent into Syria and, and, and Syrian terrorists got organized in order to um, destroy the Syrian government as well. Um, Russia intervened because basically a, an armed terrorist insurgency was being organized very close to Russia's borders from where it could spread, spread to um, to to, to Russia itself and to Central Asian republics. And so um, Russia decided to nip that in the bud and, and did so. So now ISIS has been destroyed and all of the other terrorist groups that have been supported by the Pentagon and by the State Department uh, have been pretty much demolished and all that remains is a bunch of, uh, a bunch of Americans uh, guarding a bunch of oil fields and stealing Syrian oil. Um, so. Crimea is def definitely a different thing. What happened there is that uh, the United States pumped something like between five and six billion dollars into, uh, into the Ukraine in order to politically destabilize it. And mm -hmm. uh, it didn't actually go the way they wanted because uh, they, they, got, they basically got 
uh, the previous, uh, well, two presidents ago, Ukrainian president, to agree to join the EU and play along with NATO. And, but, and, and he was a very corrupt, crooked man. I uh, didn't like him at all, but, but he had his good points. And one of them was that he knew arithmetic. Mm-hmm. So he did a bit of math and realized that this would, this would bankrupt him personally and the country as a whole. So he turned around and, and said, well, I, I want to instead join the trade union with, with Russia and the other Eurasian countries. And that's when the State Department pulled the trigger and suddenly there was a revolution in Kiev. The government there was overthrown. Um, the next thing that happened is that Crimea, uh, the people of Crimea, Crimea was uh, basically an independent state within a state within Ukraine. It had autonomy. Uh, it had its own parliament and its own government. That parliament decided to secede from the Ukraine and they, they held a referendum, one of several, uh, where a vast, the vast majority of the people there voted to leave the Ukraine and, and rejoin Russia. The Ukraine mm-hmm. has been part of Russia for many mm-hmm. centuries. Uh, it was lumped in with the Ukraine, or actually Ukraine didn't exist at the time, with the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. That was done by Khrushchev. Uh, rel- relatively recently. It was never really integrated into the Ukraine. It's just this peninsula that uh, um, you, people from the Ukraine went on vacations to. And, and so um, it rejoined Russia uh, uh, by lawful means. It, it also, wasn't any kind of a rebellion. Uh, also culturally, because when you, because to me the dividing line is Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy. And when you look at Ukraine, are they Roman Catholic or are they Greek Orthodox? Do they, would they be more culturally in tune with Russia or uh, Poland and Lithuania? Well, uh, the Ukraine is, is really not a country. It's, it's a, a Balkanized territory. It's, it's very much like the Balkans. And, and uh, different parts of it are very inter, interwoven. Uh, the eastern parts of it are really Russia. They were lumped in with what became the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic in the 20s by Vladimir Lenin, Mm -hmm. who uh, wanted a Russian presence there in order to sort of industrialize the place a little faster. Um, And and those people never felt that they belonged to any entity called the Ukraine. Um, There was never any country called the Ukraine until a very brief period of time uh, after the Russian Revolution and then most recently after the Soviet collapse. Before that, the Ukraine didn't exist. So the people of Crimea, which Crimea has been part of Russia since it basically went over from, from, from the Mongol Empire to mm-hmm. Russia. Um, it was ruled, last ruled by a Khan who was given political asylum in Russia. Then unfortunately, he decided to go to Turkey where he was executed. That, that was an unfortunate decision on his part. But, um, you know, Crimea lawfully joined the Russian Empire many centuries ago, and then it lawfully rejoined the Russian Federation recently. And and uh, standing in the way of the Crimean people, as the West chose to do, was a rather silly thing for them to do. It's just not, not a viable decision at all. As far as uh, troops rolling into Crimea, et cetera, well, troops have been in Crimea for many centuries, Russian troops. They were there under international agreement most recently. Uh, the government in Kiev was getting huge payments for stationing those troops there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, 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 they didn't insert any new troops there, and there was no fighting because they, the Ukrainians that, who were there, they pretty much just surrendered. They, they immediately surrendered. A lot of them requested Russian passports. A lot of them are still in Crimea with Russian passports. A few of them went back for family reasons, went back to the Ukraine, but it was all done perfectly peacefully and above board and perfectly by legal means. As I've heard, I'll hear, or we probably will hear it again in these clips. Uh, how is it that the Ukraine uh, is now a, a strategic ally of the United States? I don't understand how they went from East European, former Soviet uh, 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 Republic to now a strategic partner. I mean, what does Ukraine offer America? That's something I don't understand. 
um, shame, I think, is the main product that the Ukraine produces. That's, mm. that's, that's what it exports to the United States. Look at congressional hearings now. What, what the Ukraine has to offer the United States is a world of pain and shame. So mm. if, if that's <laughs> something the Americans are interested in, give the Ukraine more money. They'll steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, on that, uh, we'll head off to our next clip. Uh, let me go ahead and share our screen. This crisis in Syria, in which we saw the oh, United. Sorry, I was. I'm going back. There we go. Okay, and this gets us back into the election stealing narrative. United States 2020 elections are not undermined by a foreign entity, and that I think is the thing of most concern. More so than anything, maybe not even in the Middle East, is how now Russia has used our own internal divisions that we have and is using it against us every single day. So, Dimitri. I don't understand when she's talking about our using our divisions against us. It sounds rather, yeah, it just seems like bad form. Now we're, we have no proof that Russia meddled in 2016. It's a narrative. And now we're saying they're about to uh, influence our 2020 elections. <laughs> well, she has a point. I hate to say it, but she has a point. The way Russia influences American politics is by existing and by being Russia, by being a relatively socially conservative place that puts a lot of value on intact families with children, that believes that children are the future and that mommy and daddy should bring up families, not random strangers of uh, arbitrary genders. Um, and that is incredibly appealing to uh, a large part of the American electorate who have been sidelined by political correctness and enforced uh, uh, social justice uh, phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, so just because Russia exists and is Russia makes it extremely appealing as a model for a lot of people. Uh, there are lots of Christian families that are thinking about moving to Russia, and some of them actually have. I know some of them. Interesting. And they did that, they did that for uh, these specific reasons, is that they believe that America has become Sodom and Gomorrah. They, they believe that it's a place that's going to hell, that's going to burn in hell, and they want to be free of it. And, and so there are a lot of Americans who are very attuned to that train of thought. Um, and, and so she has a point. She has a point. Interesting. That's an amazing perspective, Dimitri. And it's something that I think is, it, it's, it just, it's lost on Americans. As you're saying, the, 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 these kernels of truth are winding their way into the, you know, the minds of people. But it's difficult because it's an it's not anything that's being pushed or uh, identified by the West or reported on by the West. And as you said, it just seems that uh, Russia's <laughs> the, the most evil that Russia can do to America is it it seems to want to be Russia and work in its own best interests. As personally, I would expect any country to do. Okay, so uh, here we go. We're going to do another clip again, villainizing Russia. I'm going to share our screen. Republicans becoming further and further apart. They pulled off in 2016, and I'm an intelligence historian, so I've got some context, the most successful covert action in human history. And it's our fault. It's not something they did because they're really good at their jobs. They're not. Malcolm's right. Right? Russia has a GDP ability. New York City, holistically, has more GDP, a higher GDP than Russia does. Russia is a nobody. They're not a near peer. They're not an almost near peer. 
But what the intelligence agencies did is something extraordinary. Once again, uh, it's belittling the economy of Russia. Uh, however, talking about their intelligence agencies and the strength of their intelligence agencies and how they're influencing uh, the the vote, their ability to do that. It's not their GDP. It's 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 their in, their evil uh, specter-esque uh, intelligence agencies. Well. Um just let, let's just uh, brush off the, the point about the New York City GDP being higher than Russia. It's not. If you look at the numbers, the New York State, not just New York City, but the New York State GDP is 1.5 trillion. Russia's is 1.56 trillion. But uh, again, you have to calculate it based on purchasing power parity factor, which is 25. So you have to right. multiply Russia's GDP by 25 and then that ends up uh, 54.6 trillion. So it's relatively huge compared to both New York City and the entire New York State. Now, as far as uh, most successful covert action in, in, in human history, well, um, a lot of people have a lot of trouble to admitting, but you know, the result of the election is the result of the failure of the liberal elite in the United States to produce results that a majority of the people would find acceptable. So they, they went their own way. And the Russians didn't have to lift a finger. Uh, not that they needed to. I think, I think the Russians at that point were pretty much resigned to having to deal with Hillary Clinton and, and were pretty well equipped to, to do so. Uh, it didn't really uh, affect them in any particular way who would be president. And mm -hmm. the fact that Trump became president for them was probably not the best outcome because Trump is incredibly unpredictable and the way uh, the, the Russian foreign ministry works is they like predictability. They like expertise. They, they, mm -hmm. they want to be able to see into the future. And if you have this loose cannon in the White House, that doesn't really help matters for them. So they weren't really interested in getting Trump elected at all. We're taken by surprise. By surprise. But now that it's happened, it's a really funny joke to them. <laughs> right. And that was uh, Dr. Vince Hooten. He heads the spy museum in Wash here in Washington, D.C. Well, he's a, 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 he should put himself on exhibit. His data is <laughs> kind of belongs in a museum, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because that seems to be his reference point. Both he and Nance, the reference points are all the Cold War. And mm -hmm. we've moved on, I'd like to think, from that. Well, great. I'm going to go ahead into our next clip. Rose of the world and the Frank Munzes of the world, and had a conversation before. Someone said Clay Cole uh, in the one before with uh, Ann Coulter or Tommy Lauren. And I just kind of chuckled, like, there's no such thing. That doesn't exist. But it's become part of our lexicon because politics has become a combat sport. And people look at it and be like, the enemy. Well, you know what? My enemy is Russia. My enemy is foreign intelligence agencies. My enemy is not you if you voted for Trump. I think you're a buffoon in many respects, but you're not my enemy. Right? That's the problem we run into, and it's opened us up to this kind of a covert action. And we're going to be in a position in 2020 and 2024 because we've done nothing to stop it. And the only way we are going to have to do anything to stop it is by coming together and agreeing that our enemy is outside of our country, not inside of it. It's not somebody from Kansas or from Washington. It's I'm not the enemy who's outside the Beltway. I'm not the... I'm 16th generation American, so you can go to hell if you tell me to go back where I came from. All right, and every member of my- Okay. And our share there. So once again, uh, the vilification of Russia. Is, is Russia the enemy of the United States, Dimitri? Well, no, it's, it's not the neighbor's dog who ran through the house and, and you know, tipped the table with the Kool-Aid on it. You know, that, that's kind of a useless thing to keep saying, and, and, and that's not very helpful. What's happening in the United Sna States now is that the elite that has been running the country for a really long time, sort of the, the power behind the, the throne, if there is one, has split in two. It has fractured. Mm. And, and these people are at each other's throats now. 
And the way they're used to dealing with the rest of the world is they're special. They can, they can do anything. They can commit war crimes and get away with it. But everybody else has to do, what, do as they're told or they're terribly vilified and bombed into submission, destroyed, whatever, and anything goes. But now that they're at each other's throats, they're bombing each other into submission. And the rest of the world, I guess, can roast marshmallows if they want to or, or look the other way if they can't bear to watch. But it's not going to help the United States to say, oh, let's blame Russia for what we're doing to each other. You know, that's, that's a ridiculous, just completely mentally retarded approach. It's, it's, it's kind of like this kindergarten thing. You know, it's the neighbor's dog that ran through the house mm -hmm. and tipped over the Kool-Aid. <laughs> that's what they're doing. It's, it's tragic. And it, as you said, it's not helpful domestically because we have a lot to sort out. The citizens of this country, we have a lot to sort out with each other. And to say, wow, the reason we, we can't have a discussion on immigration or on uh, the economy or on race because Russia's up there stopping us. No, we're, I, I think that was brilliant what you said, Dimitri. We're the ones stopping it. And we seem to be okay with that because uh, I think uh, Hooten had made the comment something, well, you know, politics is now war. No, in, in America, politics is a team sport. You're either on one team or the other team and it's your team winning. It's not about having a discussion it's not about looking objectively at candidates. And, uh, you know, it, to me, that's the, that's the tragedy right now because the stakes are really high for us. We, when you look at, for instance, the national debt, well, the federal debt is 23 trillion now. But if you look at all the states, all the localities, the unfunded mandates, it's over $125 trillion. We can't pay that back. We're, our industry is sitting overseas. Uh, everything, our, our money, our wealth goes overseas or goes in the hands of just a few people. These are serious issues and we just don't seem to want to uh, grasp them. We'd rather believe that there's a boogeyman out there creating all this. Well, yes. I mean, there, there are a lot of structural things that Americans need to address. They have a country that exports what your typical 19th century European colony would export. Things like... Uh, soybeans, um, corn, um, wood pulp, um, scrap metal, uh, garbage used to be a big export. Now there are no takers. Right. So the garbage is just piling it's up. It's piling up. We're, we don't know what to do with our recyclables in the city I live in. That's right. Yeah. And it, uh, burning it is too, too high tech at this point and nobody knows how to do it. Um, and, and uh, of course, services are a big export, but you know, services are one of those things that can pretty much go away in a hurry. Um, and, and then there are these gigantic structural trade deficits with countries like China is an important one. Russia has a huge trade surplus too with uh, the rest of the world. That's mostly with, uh, with the European Union. Mm -hmm. But what countries like Russia and China, the trade surplus countries are doing is they're no longer investing it in American debt. They're no longer buying up treasuries. Instead, they're lending that money out to other developing countries. And that's just the knell of death for, for the, the, the entire oh, scheme. Absolutely, uh, because the countries have to pay back that debt in dollars if they accumulate it in dollars. Yeah, that, that's well, yes. never a good thing. Uh, they have to pay back in dollars to Russia and China. Um, which is which is the real real part of the horror show, um, and and so uh, instead of, you know, not only is the U.S. A, a, a major debtor, but the creditors are now owned by somebody else, um, and and so Americans have to understand that they've basically spent spent their fortune well into this century, that it'll take them many decades to crawl out of that hole. If, and that if they we, will have if, to if, crawl out of that hole. Yeah, if we ever can. Uh, recently, I read the book Silk Roads, and he was talking about how all the silver that Spain mined and stole from the Americas, over 25% of it wound its way into India and China. 
because they would mm -hmm. buy products from them. And within three generations of that enormous amount of wealth, Spain was defaulting on its debts. The, mm -hmm. the empire crumbled. Uh, Spain is still a backwards country uh, in a number of respects. It's certainly not, it, it was the world hegemon for a period of time. And I just see how what we've done with, again, the offshoring of our industry, all of our wealth going abroad. And we seem to think with dollar diplomacy that we're going to keep this thing going. I think we're in for a rude shock. And uh, again, it gets back to what we were saying earlier. It's not some boogeyman. It's not Russia. It's, uh, it's what we do to ourselves. We exported our industry abroad. That was a conscious decision. We seem to think that by the propaganda that there were jobs that didn't have an economic right to exist. Yet everyone seemed to be happy to get those jobs. Yeah, well, there's a huge conversation to be had uh, in American politics, which, which is how, how can people remain decent and useful to each other given the dire circumstances that are going to occur? And that's just not happening. No, it, it's, it's not because what happens when uh, all of a sudden, everything becomes very scarce. Uh, finding a decent meal becomes an issue. Having water, having systems like sewer, that are, sewer and transportation systems that are working. Uh, we look at California, for instance. It, the state has over 40 million people in it, yet the infrastructure was built for 20 million. There hasn't been any significant changes to its infrastructure in decades, and yet becoming more populous, there's more demands on the system, and we're seeing these rolling blackouts, uh, homeless, like uh, every time I'll be back in Los Angeles early next month, and uh, every time I go back, they, they, I, just, I just see more and more and more homelessness. I see more and more uh, this crumbling of the infrastructure. You know, you look below the huge buildings that are going up in downtown Los Angeles, and the sidewalks are crumbling. The water mains are breaking. Uh, this has, is this a facet of collapse in a way, Dimitri? Maybe this delusional thinking in addition to what we're actually seeing unfold before our eyes? Well, yes, the sky, skyscrapers are sort of the, the fruiting bodies of a fungus that's eating the country. That's, <laughs> that's how I look at it. They're the mushrooms. Oh, too funny. Uh, okay, well, our next clip is we actually get to hear from the one little bit of opposition there on the panel. Here we go, got my mouse there and enlarging, and here we go. And I would say the same about any country in the world. And, and, and to think that we as Americans, who ourselves, you mentioned it, have the CIA, who ourselves encourage regime change all around this world, who ourselves are in areas right now because of oil, for sole purposes of protecting oil, and have been for decades, I find it very almost hypocritical to say on that point. So before people start, you know, get I, I, those that have maybe, you know, I understand if you want to talk about Ukraine, we can talk about Ukraine. In fact, this should not be Russia, 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 Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. But okay. So is she justified in calling people out on their hypocrisy on the panel, Dimitri? Yes. Changing the subject slightly, uh, let's talk about uh, Belarus, Belarus. Mm -hmm. It's right next to Russia and Ukraine. Um, it doesn't have diplomatic relations with the United States. And the reason is because it doesn't want a United, a, a, a United States embassy on its soil. Guess what the reason for that is? What is that? It doesn't want to have its government overthrown. See, if you don't have a United States embassy on your soil, your chances of having your government overthrown in, in some kind of a violent revolution are pretty much nil. Things are under control. But the moment you, get, you let those American quote unquote diplomats in, uh, it, you know, things become definitely shaky. I mean, and I, I'd, have, have, I'd have to say, trouble. When the American diplomats come in along with our NGOs, uh, we have a mm -hmm. number of non-government organizations. There are people that, and I'll say the name, George Soros, that operate organizations mm -hmm. that practice a form of extraterritoriality uh, and seem to 
try to influence events in sovereign countries that may be against their own best interest. Yes, well, Russia and China basically have uh, fully staffed departments uh, uh, that, that are preparing cases that are used to ban various Western NGOs. Uh, so the Atlantic Council got banned in Russia recently, and, and uh, Ariel Cohen, who keeps appearing on Russian mm -hmm. television as a commentator, who used to be uh, basically identified as working for the Atlantic Council, the moment that happened, he like switched like this, and suddenly he was a Bloomberg columnist. <laughs> I found that really funny. But <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny when um, I look at reporters, journalists today, it's almost like to get a paycheck, they know what will and won't fly these days when it comes to the narrative. Because someone was asking, well, is there a power that's orchestrating? And I said, more, probably they, they know what will and won't get published. They know it will end up in, you know, amounting to a payday or not. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, everyone's just looking for that check in a way. Yeah, who needs censorship when you have self-censorship? By mm -hmm. that standard, the U.S. is the most censored country in the world. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, this is interesting uh, where they, when, once again, they are talking, uh, the rebut to uh, the woman from RT, her name is Scotty Nell Hughes, and their rebut was this. Oh, well, <coughs> let me uh, go ahead and share our screen again. I still, I gotta say, I'm overwhelmed with technology. It's, it's, it's amazing we're able to do this. You're in Moscow, I'm here in the US. Well, first of all, question, I have a question. Are you paid, you get a paycheck from Russia today? Absolutely, I get paid. Yeah, okay, then you get paid by an ex-KGB officer. No, I get paid by the oil and gas companies. You get oh, you paid, work for NBC, correct? Or you get paid by the Russian State Federation that funds Russia today which means that Vladimir Putin is the guy who's ultimately signing your paycheck. You may think that is not you are true. Free. I'll I let you come back. Okay. Let me finish. You may think that you're fair and you're free and you're independent. Stalin set up news organizations in the United States to do the same thing. Okay? This, you know what? I can tell you something right now. U.S. journalism is not funded by the United States government directly or NPR, <laughs> okay? NPR is a private organization. I don't know if you can get that. Those taxpayer dollars are going into it. No, but as a matter of fact, NPR has fundraisers for raising money. My point is this. Yeah, and the oil companies are the biggest supporters. So you'll, you'll, you never seem to, the oil cup in any NPR, PBS show, the oil companies always have the last word. <laughs> so they, yeah, the oil they companies. Uh, yeah, Arthur Daniel Midlands, and, right. uh, Archer Daniel Midlands, and hey. uh, Monsanto, uh, or Bayer now. You want to get away from uh, genetically modified uh, foods and get on the organic? Not a chance, because at the end of the day, you're always hit with, eight, like you're saying, ADM. That's what right. And if, if, if uh, anybody at NPR tries to push a story that is contrary to what any of those uh, major companies like to see, they get a fax immediately and it gets stopped. Um, so that, that level of censorship is, is real and it's actually like very, very heavy handed. Um, but in terms of uh, funding, you know, Voice of America is funded by the United States. It's, it's basically, uh, you know, part of the, it's part of the federal budget. Uh, uh, there's a radio station, Echo of Moscow, that's partially funded by, uh, by the United States. Uh, BBC, of course, is funded. It's, right. you know, it's a propaganda outlet for the British government. Um, Deutsche Welle, which also broadcasts into Russia, is funded by the German government. Um, that is not an untypical thing. A lot of countries that have a bit of spare cash in, invested in soft power, which is broadcasting their version of the news into countries of their choice. And, and uh, the United States is probably, uh, the biggest spender in that category because not only do they spend on their official broadcasters like Radio Free Europe, which mm -hmm. is basically a CIA front or Voice of America, but they also, uh, through their various NGOs, funnel money to bloggers and 
and uh, media personalities and, and uh, give a bit of money to various students to, to teach them what they want them to learn. And, and, and they, they make their inroads in a lot of other little ways that, that uh, are definitely not above board. So saying that, well, no, we have free media. Well, first of all, it's not free. Secondly, uh, that it's not sponsored by the government. Well, no, it is sponsored by the government. So again, uh, alternative yeah. facts. Yeah, and it's, I was just having a discussion last night with someone. Uh, we're looking at trying to do a boy, possibly do a boycott of this one company for their, uh, their practices, their labor practices and their abuse of employment visa programs. And you never hear boycott anymore because it's so effective. Uh, it's, but you don't, I, I, mainstream media will not let you interfere with a big company's uh, flow of cash. And mm -hmm. so we don't, and it's, a, boycotts are amazingly effective, but where, where are the unions with them? Where are these groups that are supposedly advocating for change? Just say, hey, I'm not going to buy my stuff from ABC company and get a hundred thousand people to do that. You change things overnight, but we don't seem to be able to do that simply because it's effective. I made that point a long time ago. You, you're not allowed to say things that will put people off their shopping. Yeah, absolutely. It's as simple as that. Do you recall a mutual friend of ours, James Howard Kunstler? He mm -hmm. made this statement, and I use it all the time. He said, don't allow, ever allow anyone to call you a consumer. You're a citizen. Because citizens have not only rights, but obligations and responsibilities to each other, to their communities. And I think that's a brilliant way to put it. But it seems that, and again, I guess it goes back to the title of your latest book. <laughs> they either want us to get be cows where they're milking us for our cash. And when that ends, we just get hauled off to the slaughter block and uh, denied health care. <laughs> then off we go, no longer uh, there to feed the system. Okay, the next clip, uh, Dimitri, is, uh, this is kind of like that uh, Russian people nice, Putin bad, the Russian people kind of want him out narrative. I will go ahead and share our screen. I think Scotty raised a really important point, uh, and that is the, the distinction between Russian people and modern. Uh, and it is very easy. It's uh, the distinction between Vladimir Putin and the Russian people. It is very easy when we say Russia to think everybody encapsulated in the country versus Russian government. And there is actually a term in diplomacy that we use called track to diplomacy or public diplomacy. And that's all about how people connect with each other. The Russian people have been activating and urging free and fair elections in their own country. Well, there you go. I'll go ahead and stop our share. So what did you think, Dimitri? <laughs> Well, let me tell you a sad, sad story about Russian liberals. Uh, they, they, we call them the one percenters here because they never get uh, more than 1% of the vote, except maybe in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest of the people are sick and tired of them and just want them to go away. Um, in terms of Putin, Putin's uh, popularity, it, it, it's consistently high. It's much higher than any U.S. politician. There's a lot of support for him. Uh, people really feel that he's on their side, that he, he's, he struggles sometimes, but he does whatever he can for them. Uh, they have a much lower opinion of uh, members of his, his government, of Medvedev's cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, really, uh, they, they really don't see how these people are executing the plans. Basically, they're not, Putin gave them a bunch of orders and they're not, they're, they're dragging their feet. They're failing in a lot of ways. They're in the process, some of them are in the process of getting fired for it. That's kind of an mm -hmm. interesting development. But the people don't really like the various ministers. They don't really like the bureaucracy. And that's very traditional in Russia. 
Russians yes. never like their government, but they do like their leaders some of the time. The new development in Russia is um, that um, in a lot of regions, the people really, really like their governors, their regional governors. A lot of them are young. They're mm -hmm. new recruits. Um, and they, they uh, are, a lot of them, some of them are in jail because they screwed up. They're in jail mm -hmm. for corruption for long, long sentences. Uh, that has happened too. Uh, the process of sending officials to jail is an ongoing one in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, old habits die hard, that sort of thing. But there's a new development, which is that there, there are regional governors that are quite powerful and quite popular with the people that get things done. They're, they're, they're very impressive men and women. And uh, that's where the next generation of leadership is going to come from. Um, right, it'll, it'll start bubbling up from the, this local level into the regional, into the national. Yes, uh, that, that's probably what's going to happen. And you know, when people ask me what's going to come after Putin, I tell them what, what's going to come after Putin is more Putin, except by a different name. Same style, you know, same substance, just different name, uh, because he's been basically um, bringing up, cultivating this next generation of leaders, which, by the way, was the glaring failure of, of, the, of the Soviet elite. They, they, mm -hmm. they couldn't find replacements for themselves. They all died of uh, old age. And the best they could do was get Gorbachev in, who it turned out to be a traitor, who destroyed the country. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so that's, that's a hard learned lesson. That's not going to be repeated. But in terms of driving a wedge between the government and the people from an American perspective, well, that's just clueless, you know? Like go grow some vegetables or something, you know, you know take up macrame. Don't, don't mess with international politics if that's, if that's what you have to offer. Right, and frankly, uh, it goes without saying, Every, it's, local politics is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, that's the thing that you can see. You can see if your trash is being picked up or not. You can, you bump into, you know, in the small city that I live in, uh, I bump into the mayor and the mayor's chief of staff all the time at events. So, and you can talk to them and communicate with them and you feel more enfranchised, I guess. Great. Uh, well, here we go. Uh, this is, I thought this next clip is going to be interesting because the thing of it is Russia is not an ordinary country. There's something <laughs> very special about Russia. Here we go. Screen is shared and playing. But they have chosen to be an abnormal country. And therefore, you can't have relations with him any more than we can have relations with North Korea. It takes a country that recognizes international borders, that has some semblance of respect for human rights, that has some respect for uh, the economic productivity of its citizens, it doesn't simply steal from them, in order to have a normal relationship with that country. And I don't have a great answer other than the fact that we should be supporting civil society in Russia, and we should be publicizing the extreme kleptocracy of their leader, who is robbing them blind. And one of the things that we have lost with Donald Trump is the ability to use the voice of America, quite literally the voice of America, but also the moral authority of America, to explain to the Russian people and explain to the world that they are being taken for suckers. They are being stolen from. What could be going towards development of their universities, development of their infrastructure, development of their entire capital of the population is instead going into Vladimir Putin's pocket. So we should be doing things to advertise, to make clear to the Russian people who they are dealing with. And that they could have a far better life. They could have all the things they see in the West, except for the fact they live under this autocratic. Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, first off, do the Russian people want everything they see in the West, Dimitri? Uh, no, just the things they like 
and they have them already. So uh, they, they, they drive cars that look like uh, Western cars, except that they were made in Russia, in Russian factories. Uh, by I, I actually drive a Russian motorcycle, so. Oh, okay, that, that's very cool. But you can, you can now buy a Russian Mercedes. You can buy uh, a, any brand car, uh, pretty much made in Russia and not just uh, assembled, but the components as well. They make the engines here now too. Uh, you go to a shopping mall here and uh, all of the brands from around the world are represented, all of the ones mm -hmm. that the Russians like. So um, the Russians have pretty much built uh, a, their own version of Western capitalism right here, except Russian style to suit their needs and, and uh, they don't need any convincing, really. Uh, lots of signs in English, and, and, and uh, that, that's pretty much standard fare here at this point. Now, in terms of uh, this narrative that, you know, mm -hmm. Putin is a thief and Russia is corrupt. And oh, and, so and by better. the way, the woman who said that, her name is Jennifer Rubin. She's a journalist. Mm -hmm. She's also a neoconservative. So that's where she's coming from. Did well, he... yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter where she's coming from. It's it's just this uh, this narrative that they keep pushing and that they keep putting money behind it, and it's, it just keeps falling over. Because the fact is that since Putin came to power, uh, the fortunes of uh, Russians, just normal everyday Russians, mm -hmm. not the elite, um, have doubled, quadrupled many times. Uh, people, are li Russians, are living longer, happier, and healthier lives now than at any time in Russian history. What is uh, the average life expectancy for a Russian today, Dimitri? 70. 70, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there's still a lot of problems here, but- um, But didn't you the, point the out, I, 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 I recall in your book, Reinventing Collapse, one of the things that happen is life, when a society collapses, life expectancy goes down. Uh, actually, we're seeing that here in the United States uh, for males. Yes. Life expectancy mm -hmm. is going down. And boy, what is that an indicator of, I wonder? Yes, well, enforced hopelessness, I think, is a form of genocide. That's mm. that's the way I look at it. You don't have to actually, like, gas people. You can just steal their hopes of, of having a normal life for themselves and, and their children, and they will... They will die, they will overdose, they will drink themselves to death. That's what's happening in the United States now. That's what was happening in, in, in Russia in the 1990s. An entire uh, cohort mm. drank themselves to death. And mm -hmm. Russia is no longer even in the top five heaviest drinking countries in the world now. You know, the leader now is Lithuania. Um, I've you know, been to Lithuania. Country. It's it's actually one of the most graffitied countries I've ever been to. So maybe yeah. that's indicative of what's going on. And in fact, I went on a tour one day, I ended up at a bar with the tour guide and several of her friends. Uh, the bartender, for instance, had a law degree, but couldn't, you know, there's no place for her to practice. Uh, mm -hmm. And the despair, you know, they're just saying, you know, this is what I make. This is what rent costs, what, fuel costs with this, there's just no winning, you know, here. And you mm -hmm. can kind of understand why this begins to happen. Uh, the county that I live in, uh, the morgue is always full and mm -hmm. it's overdoses. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I guess. Yeah, but, but not much of that happening in Russia anymore. Um, hmm. you know, the, in Russia, the new thing is a healthy lifestyle gym memberships at an all, are at an all-time high. You know, mm -hmm. personal trainer is a, a hip profession these days. Women are all off to yoga and Pilates classes, and, you know, everybody's trying to get fit, mm -hmm. especially the young people. The young people are strikingly fit, hardly any obesity at all. Um, so if you look at the population, it's just ha healthy, happy, contented, mostly contented. Mm -hmm. um, which you can't say about the United States at this point. So trying to claim that, well, you're doing very badly because Putin stole all of your money. Uh, and the reason you should believe this is because we gave a whole bunch of money to this guy, Navalny, who, um, <laughs> who, who organized underage kids into some kind of a protest movement 
you know, people are so sick of that. So this this woman, Ruben, you know, she she's just again, she she's kind of becoming a fossil. You know, she's a laughing stock. We we know what her game is. We know where she gets the money. Um, she should cut it out. Just cut her losses and do something else. You know, it's interesting. I wasn't there for it, but the next day, Sunday at Politicon, Malcolm Nance was up on a stage with um, with uh, a few other people, and he uh, was doing the Russia, Russia, Russia thing. And a large group of people started to shout, walk away, walk away. I mean, I could hear it in the next room. And so that tells me, it, uh, the, the article I wrote, I took a, a thing from Yeats's poem, uh, where the falconer can no longer hear the, fa the, the falcon can no longer hear the falconer. Uh, and I think that's where American society is going. Yeah, well, Nance is a specific type of person who just loves the sound of his own voice, uh, but can't learn anything new to say. So he just keeps going on and on and on. That's, that's, what, that's how he strikes me. Mm -hmm. So our last clip, uh, Dimitri, is going to be, uh, I think it's uh, Hooten who talks about some historical perspective on Russian borders and the West. So I'll go ahead and share that now. For some of the historians or self-proclaimed historians of the panel, um, as I'm sure, I'm not, not insulting, I'm sure you are historians. As you're all aware, um, during World War II, we actually teamed up with Russia to fight the Nazis, rightfully so. Uh, looking back, do you think it could have been possible for us to not be permanent enemies with the Soviet Union? Because, um, just think, I, the only priority in the Cold War should have been to make sure that they don't nuke us, which they were never going to do because of mutually assured destruction. We chose to fight them. We chose to make an enemy out of them. Germany declared war on us, Russia did not. So could we have just gone forward? Starts DJ comrade. Um, so, look, it's all about, this is what George Kennan was asked in 1947, by George Kennan, the famous American diplomat, who was the one that the Americans, people like Gary Truman had the same question you did. Why in the world are these guys trying to push back? And actually, we reached out our hands to the Soviet Union after World War II and said, join the International Monetary Fund, join the World Bank. In fact, we talked about internationalization of atomic weapons before they even had them themselves. And they said, no, no, it said, yet, yet, yet. And it turned out they asked Kennan why, and Kennan said what I've kind of talked about before, was it was the inherent Russianness of the Soviet Union, the idea that an illegitimate government needed to have a foreign boogeyman. And for Stalin to maintain the power that is now 25 million less people population to recreate the industry that was necessary. Now, there we go. Well, to start with, um an illegitimate government needs to have a foreign boogeyman. That is called projecting the shadow. It yes. takes something you don't like about yourself and you try to pin it onto somebody else. Because um, is, in terms is the of United Russia, States vilified in Russia the way Russia is vilified in the United States, Dmitry? Well, no. I mean, first of all, Russia is full of uh, American culture. It's full of Disney. There's a, a Disney channel that kids watch. A lot of cartoons are American cartoons. There's a lot of uh, clothing that is basically from American designers. They're now mm -hmm. international brands, but they started out as American. Uh, Hollywood films, everybody knows Sylvester Stallone. Everybody knows The Terminator. He's a popular one here. In fact, he showed up here for, for some kind of like a, a training seminar, you know, a Arnold show Schwarzenegger. thing. Ar Arnold showed up in St. Petersburg to <laughs> teach seminars and, you know, how to be yourself how to be the Terminator. <laughs> yeah, that, so the Russians are totally into that. Now, in terms of politics, in terms of how the government behaves, uh, there's a, a definitely uh, a different perspective. And it used, it used to be um, very favorable in the 1990s, where people were convinced that America was the model. At that point, a lot of people went over to the United States. A lot of emigres uh, came back to Russia. Um, a lot of people went to school in the United States and came back. And uh, then uh, the attitude shifted because the Russians actually realized what the United States, what life in the United States 
is really like. Mm. Um, well, it's funny, that it's funny you say that. When I, when I, a few years ago, I was in Poland and I was in Krakow and the guy leading our bicycle tour had lived in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area for a few years. And he moved back to Poland. He said, all I did was work in America. I mean, here I'm back. I don't make a lot of money, but I have my friends. The food is good. The lifestyle is good. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I've noticed that. So, yeah, so the Russians pick and choose, but in terms of, uh, you know, picking and choosing American style democracy, at that point, that will just make people laugh. Like, do you want the democracy like America has now? Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Who would want that? You know what legalized corruption where I can bribe you with a campaign contribution? Who wouldn't want mm -hmm. that? No, it doesn't stop there. I mean, you know, the, the, the whole impeachment thing is, you know, there's yeah. a play-by-play -play for that on Russian television. And it's a comedy show. <laughs> um, so, it's, no, it's that, that, that yeah. part of it, just, that, that dog don't hunt, you know, don't, don't, try to, don't try that in Russia. It just, it's, it's going to go nowhere really, really fast. But in terms of Russia, you know, being this place that Americans can't deal with, well, the thing about Russia is that it wants to be treated as an equal. It, it does, it's not going to play second fiddle to the United States. It's not going to listen to the, the United States and not be listened to. It, that is also a non-starter. And that's something that American uh, Washingtonians um, aren't able to accept. They, basically, mm -hmm. their, their idea is you show up, you tell people what you want them to do, uh, either they do it or they don't. If they don't, then you sanction them. If they still refuse to do what they want, what you want them to do, then you start bombing them. A now with Russia, it's sort of like, it, 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 it's sort of like a, a you know a irresistible force moves immovable object. Um, they keep smashing their foreheads against Russia and then wondering what the hell is going on. And what's going on is that Russia is very different from most other countries. Uh, it never attacks other countries, but it always wins the wars once it gets uh, attacked, always, mm -hmm. without exception. Um, and uh, it takes its uh, defense very, very seriously. You know, it has huge territory, it has all the resources it needs, and it will defend them. And if anybody tries to uh, uh, get at those resources without paying them, well, they'll end up paying more. That's all that's going to happen. Is They'll still buy mm -hmm. resources from Russia because there's nowhere else they can get them, but they'll be more expensive. And mm. the Americans just can't learn that lesson. Yeah, well, Dimitri, uh, I really appreciate your being here today with me to review those clips. Because I got to say, when I was watching this panel in Nashville, all I could think of, what would Dimitri say to this? What would Dimitri say? So I'm glad we were able to do that today. Uh, Dimitri, before uh, I, I begin our, uh, closing down uh, today's podcast, uh, how can people get a hold of you? How can they reach you? Oh, well, you know, my, my email address is actually hanging out there on my blog. If you look for contact, um, that's probably the easiest way to contact me if personally. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's a, a lively discussion um, usually uh, of, of whatever I post on, on Patreon and on Subscribestar, which are the, the two platforms where, uh, where I blog. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really I, recommend everyone subscribe to your blog. The insights are amazing. Well, thank you. I, I, yeah, this, this, several months ago when I was trying to make sense as to why we would put an armored battalion into Lithuania, you made a comment because it'll give the Russians something to shoot at. <laughs> I thought that was great because that's like there's no strategic or tactical significance to this. Why are we doing it? They're surrounded, cut off. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But you know, I, I do well, get there, a lot of insights. Well, there are a lot of things that the Americans do that are basically just to justify printing and stealing more money. They print money, they steal money, but they have to have some kind of activity to justify that. Mm -hmm. So why not move troops to, to Lithuania? 
why why not give money to Elon Musk to build his star hopper, which explodes on the launching pad? You know, at least there's something happening. So they cudgeled together this thing, right, made of aluminum and plastic, and it blows up. Well, look, they did something. So mm -hmm. print some money and give it to us. Yeah, and that's that's the level at which people operate these days in the United States. If you have yeah, a printing that's... press, if that's the only equipment you have left, then what do you do? And that that's tragic, Dimitri. It actually makes me sad because at the end of the day, we Americans are getting used every year. Things seem to get a little bit worse economically uh, in terms of our quality of life. Uh, our expectations, let's say, uh, just on customer service are going down and down and down. Uh, we're getting paid less, working more, and I, I'm saddened. I, I love my country. I, I'm one of the lucky few. When I walk outside my door, I live in a place where we have a walkability score of 99 out of 100. I love the city I live in. I'm proud of the county and the work uh, citizens groups do there. Uh, but I'm saddened. I'm saddened because uh, we are not, things are not getting better. As you had mentioned in Russia, you know, year over year, things do seem to be getting better. Nowhere, nowhere is perfect. The grass is never greener. But I think we as Americans need to look at these narratives, this propaganda that's being forced on us 24-7. Uh, then the biggest culprits are these cable news channels. And I'm hoping that people will begin to wake up slowly. And perhaps it'll happen slowly, but I'm, I, I would imagine surely. Because the reality, just it's just inescapable at this point. Well, well once we... Once we hit 10% penetration, uh, that's all it'll take. Good. Once we displace 10% of the audience. Yeah. Wonderful. Good. <laughs> there you go. Well, Dimitri, thanks so much for joining me today. And to our listening audience, uh, if you like this podcast, please give us a thumbs up and share, uh, whether it's on Facebook, tw you tweet it out, Instagram, by all means, share it out. We're in a fortunate position. We don't really have to rely heavily on funding, but we do want to get the word and the messaging out. Well, Dimitri, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. This was great. Wonderful. Cheers.